alto saxophone, actually any saxophone clinic. Um, I am Jennifer Seiler. I am your Region 23 Secretary and your uh, coordinator for these clinics. So I'm going to take a moment just to say welcome. And I hope you've had a good day so far. It is my pleasure to introduce you to your clinician today. Uh, he is the director of the School of Music for Sam Houston State University. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Scott Puggy. Let me just quickly go through that. Does everyone have a packet? I'm just going to go through that quickly and then I'll go specifically into the uh, etudes themselves. But some of the things that goes on into this packet for philosophy and my teaching and expectation is a lot more about how to practice. Um, the particular etudes, which I will go over, give you some suggestions, uh, fingerings, etc., etc. But for me, I find as a, as a teacher, I spend the majority of my time teaching my students how to practice. And so there's a lot of philosophy in here that I would like you to walk away with um, that's applied particularly to these etudes, but also something that you can apply to anything and everything else that you do as you go, go beyond. Um, dealing with the etudes themselves, uh, you'll see my little key at the top. I have some of my own little shorthand for fingering suggestions. Um, and I will also go into, there's a philosophy that I have for fingerings, which is in here, that um, I strongly recommend that you adopt. They're not just random. It doesn't, the fingering just doesn't go here because it seems feels good. There's actually a rule um, as to why in public etudes. On the back side, of the A2, particularly the first one, the technical A2. What I've done is extracted, and of course I use just the uh, E major scale. Um, you can apply this to the E minor and uh, some of the other derivations. But I like the, the very first A2, the, the technical A2, really emphasizes articulation. And so what I like to do is extract the elements out of the A2, the piece, composition, whatever it is the students are working on extract it out of the piece and make exercises outside. Most of you, how many of you actually do your scales every day or every time you practice, right? So why not be practicing doing your scales that you're going to do anyway with elements that are helping you prepare for the etude? And so what I did was extracted, just as an example, I extracted all the um, different articulation possibilities that are in that etude applied them to the E major scale so that you can practice it that way. I would suggest that you um, attach it to all 12 major scales, each one of those etudes, and move on. But that philosophy is something that I'm uh, really big into because I'm, I'm very much into the mental aspects of what we do of performing. You'll see that in the back of the packet. Uh, you know, at some point during my development, I realized this animal needed as much practice as that animal. And working in that way. So what happens is a lot of times we'll be working on something and it becomes difficult for us, right? And then all of a sudden, in the music, that passage or whatever it is, we kind of start to get a psychological barrier about it, going, oh God, here it comes, here comes the hard part or whatever. I like to take it out so the music doesn't suffer that, that burden. Extract it out, work on it in some of the technical stuff. Okay, I'll get on, get on with it. The uh, next thing to do, the slower one, again, you'll see my key. Um, the one thing is probably the most um, confusing to some would be, I use kind of what looks like a harmonic symbol to emphasize the bis key. Does everyone know what the bis B flat fingering is? Okay. I just use that circle. When I see that circle, kind of my peripheral vision picks it up. I know that I'm prepared for bis as I come up into that passage. Technique. I have a lot of students that come to me and decide, hey, you know, I want to make all state this year. Let's, uh, but I can't, I can't play this A2 that fast, you know, whatever the marking is. And I usually find that they're using some of the most archaic fingerings to get through a passage. And the reason why is because those are the ones they're most familiar with or that they're most comfortable with. In my philosophy that you should use the technically most proficient fingering in any given circumstance. So I came up with these rules. They're not wholly mine, 
Uh, some of it's from Larry Teal workbook. In fact, I think I may have even borrowed his exercises to demonstrate. But one of the rules that is mine is the one for your bis and your side B flat. Meaning <coughs> if the B flat or A sharp is not followed by or preceded by a B natural, that your bis fingering is your technically most proficient fingering. I know that that may seem strange to some of you, um, but I've actually done case studies and test studies with individuals, and it's true. Because, and I won't go into the whole philosophy, on woodwind instruments, the most difficult thing we do is combine the left hand, combine the right hand with the left hand, <laughs> and, yeah, and then also trying to combine the, simultaneously the opening and closing of the keys. That's what makes woodwind instruments difficult. And if you're thinking about some of the combinations, uh, let's say an A flat to a side B flat, that's exactly what you're doing. You're trying to combine an opening and closing of the key to get between the two. In addition, you're coordinating the left and the right hand. And by the way, some of those keys you're coordinating are controlled by either the pinky or the inside of your hand. So moving it to bis totally eliminates that. So it does become technically more proficient. Yes, you may have a flip. But it's, it is keeping it in the left hand. In, into one hand, excuse me. Um, these rules are good. I suggest that you, or encourage you to adopt them in all of your playing so that when you come up to technical situations, you don't have to go in and ask, what fingering would you suggest here? You'll already have it and know. Uh, as I stand before you, I would say that 99.9% .9 of the time, everything I've played to the moment that right now have followed these rules. There's another percent of the time that I break the rules. Sometimes there's categorical exceptions, which I don't remember if I put in here. Yeah, like if the, the B flat serves as a lower neighbor to the C, I sometimes will use side rather than flipping. If it goes C, B flat, C, I'll do that. There's sometimes a categorical acceptance, and there's other times where I'll just, the fingering just felt like the thing to do at the time. But all of the rest of the time, and the majority of the time, they follow these rules, so it's a really good place to start. Side C, I can sometimes be controversial on this. I don't like side C, although our etude that we play today has side C all over, and I do recommend it. But the reason why I don't usually um, recommend side C in a lot of places where a lot of times you'll have to see it recommended by others, um, as again, is you're using two fingers to execute one note. But the, most, the biggest problem of it is tone and timbre. <coughs> And that's the only reason. So I usually use it just as a trill key or in fast neighbor motion like what I wrote in there. Wow. Should be doing your scales full range. Strongly recommended if you have it. There's no articulation on these. I strongly suggest you just do them slurred. But on all 12 major scales, full range, the fingerings based upon these rules are marked in so that you know how to go about it. Creative practice techniques. Um, I'm sure most of you have run into these or used them or band directors have had you use them. If not, you will run into them and you just have. And I strongly recommend that you use these when you're practicing the technical etudes. And I told you I mentioned um, then I'm very much into the psychological aspects of performing the left versus the right side of the brain. Most of you, you know, we have Olympics coming up. You think about athletes that train for four years for one 30-second race. What we're training for is to be our best on that, those very, you know, those 30 seconds. It's the exact same thing that you're doing for this audition. You're going to train for however many months on this etude, and then they're going to say two, four to six into the reading chair or performance chair. And that just gives the chills down the spine when you hear that. And all of a sudden, it's your time to play. And what you're preparing for is to be your best on that moment. And so these types of um, 
approaches to your practice and getting mentally prepared and ready for that will help you perform at the level that you're capable of. Okay? And I strongly recommend if you just have some idle time for some reading to get the book called The Inner Game of Tennis and read that. Um, I know it just, you're going, why am I saying tennis when it's been talking about music? Um, they actually became so popular in music circles that they've come out with other editions that are written specifically for music. And I encourage you to read it, but believe it or not, when they're talking about tennis, it seems to have a, a greater impact on music than when they're talking about music. It just seems to really be direct. Any questions about what I just said? Okay. All right, let's take a look at this first etude. <laughs> It's actually an E minor, even though I put those um, examples on E major. I did that because I could pretty much assume that most of you are doing major scales, and I wasn't really sure if you were doing minors. But I would strongly recommend that you just apply to the same key of the piece that you're playing. Um, I actually recommend in that first measure, the very second note, uh, side C. Rather than flipping, it's okay for you to use the side C there. It just makes things a little bit easier for you, okay? Second measure, the last sixteenth we want to use what's called chromatic F sharp. Everyone know what that is? It's a finger in the F natural. Your ring finger curves back and hits whatever type of horn you have. Could be a brass key, could be a pearl key uh, to make the chromatic F sharp. It avoids that flipping in the right hand, which is the same as the B to the C. And your question is, well, why would you tell people to flip in the left hand if you're, or why not, would you tell them not to flip, one more time, why would you tell them to flip in the left hand and not flip in the right hand? Well, it's because of. Because the pitch and the timbre of the note's very good. So there's no reason why not to use it, if you can, okay? And I say, if you can, your finger can't be in two places at the same time. So depending on what note precedes it, what note follows it, sometimes you can't use chromatic F sharp and you have no choice but to flip. Here you can use chromatic F sharp. Uh, when we get to the uh, second measure, fourth beat, that A sharp should definitely be a side A sharp. We do not roll the bisque. key, period. It's not a technical, it's not a, uh, what we call a, a positive action technique. Question. Yes. Could that be a one and two? Absolutely. Absolutely. I oftentimes don't use, in my older age, I use more one and twos than I did for years. I don't use one and one quite as much. I don't use those as much. And it's simply, I'm going to play bis, then I'm going to move the side, then I'm going to play one and two, then I'm going to play one and one, and just use your ears. <laughs> absolutely use one and two there. Does everyone know what he's referring to? Sorry, I just took it for granted. One and two would be your B key, and he's referring to the F sharp key in the right hand. Any of that creates an A sharp B, B flat. Uh, second system, first measure, where are you going? Side C, there is absolutely fine. When it goes down the octave on beat three and four, definitely side C. When we look down, one, two, three, four, fourth system down, first measure. I'm looking at the third beat. You see where you have D, C sharp, D? How many of you are familiar with long C sharp? Okay. Long C sharp, basically, the, the basic principle of the finger is the G key with the octave key. What it does is it takes C sharp, that sounds a little bit like eh, because there's no fingers down, and it adds a little bit more of an ah to it. And plus C sharp tends to be a flat note that raises the pitch. 
So you can have anything in the right hand down to facilitate technique. If any of you have been playing and that C-sharp cacks or breaks on you when you go across the break, this will get rid of that. And in this, this position, you can just finger D with the octave key, then all you have to do is lift these first two fingers and then back. And you've got it pretty well taken care of. I'm using the long C sharp on uh, that figure. It makes it makes it really easy. Um, also makes it so I don't have to worry about that C sharp breaking, uh, etc. Next system down, second measure, where you see the A sharp on beat three, second measure, should be a side A sharp. The one thing about this etude that's important to note in that measure that I just denoted, one, two, three, four, five, fifth system down, second measure. In the notes published with this etude, there is a note correction. I don't know if you have this or not, but the, the high C, has been changed to a high B. In your fourth beat on the and of four, that high C has been changed to a B. So you have instead of it's actually very much easier to play as a B. Okay, did most of you guys have that? Changing it to a B. I didn't change it. It's in the published documents as a note, as an adin, a um, errata. A errata, thank you. In the clarinet, it doesn't line up. If you look at the original clarinet etudes, they don't line up, but in the, in the original documentation, errata puts it as a B. It's in the materials. It's actually a note on, actually, here it is. Yes, it's uh, listed on the official ATS as B. If you look on this thing online, it's a B. Yeah, it says uh, which one are we on? Number eight. Yes, next to the last note, measure two of line five should be a high B. Plus, whenever you play for judges, we should play this B and not a C. That's correct. Then on the very next measure, beat one. Recommend side C. Using side C there. Next system down, second measure, side C on that beat one. And in chromatic F sharp. Then side A sharp. Okay, and I think that's all the magic for that etude. Any questions about those fingerings? And like I said, that's not my errata, that's the published from here. Yes, ma'am. Did you play it? Yes, I'm about to. Can you explain the trill on the D sharp on the next one? Yes. Um, there's a lot of different options you can do there. You can just trill the third finger and leave your finger on the D-sharp key. But I actually find that puts a lot of tension in my hand. I go ahead and actually trill both fingerings. It's a little bit noisier. But in this day and age, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with a lot of the repetitive syndrome injuries. You probably know carpal tunnel and stuff like that. I don't like things that, put, that stress my hand out a little bit. Um, at all. I mean, you want to make sure to keep these wrists straight and relaxed. Um, so I go ahead and drill all of them. Does that's that kind of answer your question? Is yes, I, yeah, because this, you're right, that's pressure and then. Yeah, I just, I've never just liked that. I, that. I just do both. Is there an easier way to, uh, like, probably do a slur from the, from the high beat to the low beat, like in the first measure of, of the second to last line? Uh, on that, is my whole tonal lesson in the sense that your oral cavity needs to stay set all the time. If you're having trouble with that interval, it means that you're, you're, you're voicing too much. Uh, in my school of thought, that in the practical range of the saxophone, the oral cavity needs to pretty much stay the same. 
So as hard as we can hit, except for this is a new read, so it's being special. Um, it'll respond as quick as you can mechanically hit this button. Okay, but that's a whole clinic for another day. I'm already. Yes, sir. One more question. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. In the one, two, three, four, the fifth line, last measure, first beat. When you go from C to D, can you go to that? Can we use that middle palm key? C yes, you D can. Button? It will be high. I actually go. Uh, I actually finger it normally, mm -hmm. but you could. It's just a little bit on the high side, pitch wise. Do you recommend not doing that then? Um, I don't have my students do it. I would not not recommend it because we do use that a lot of the times. I just don't do it there. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Anything else? <laughs>